name is Juri Stahl. I will be presenting A Night to Remember. Uh, in case you've never heard about the game, that's because it isn't released yet. But you can, you can check it out at uh, the Indie Showcase. Um, so uh, this is uh, a really odd game. It's um, a match two memory uh, fighting game with an epic storyline and a dual mode. So it's something that I haven't seen anywhere uh, before. So you should uh, come check it out. So how did the, how did the game start? Um, I met this guy, Derek Stevens. He's a very talented artist who also worked on uh, Unreal. And um, we wanted to work together on a project but the problem is, he's not a flash animator. So he could only uh, draw stuff, uh, but he can draw really well. So I thought, okay, what kind of game can I give this guy? And I came up with a card game, a memory game. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we worked from there. So uh, I came up with a concept of a knight uh, fighting a dragon, uh, using memory cards uh, to pick the, the right attacks. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is my mock-up. It has the knight, it has the dragon, and it has the cards. This is basically also how the, how the final game uh, looks. But much better, of course, but uh, the, whole, uh, the whole setup of the game is still exactly like this. It still has the, the stage feeling, you know, like they're performing uh, some epic play on a stage. Uh, and I had the perfect artist for the job. I mean, you could just draw all these cards, all these... Uh, uh, all these uh, static arts uh, without any animation. However, as uh, the game uh, progressed, this is already uh, the first prototype. In three hours, I, I basically finished the game and it was uh, functioning uh, properly, but it was really boring. I mean, you could just fight the dragon and that was it. So I changed a few stats so you could power up and uh, raise your defense and stuff and fight characters with, uh, with a higher level. So, but the problem was, um, how am I going to explain that you have to fight uh, different, uh, different enemies of, of different uh, levels and different skill sets, etc. So I came up with a list of enemies. Well, the first one was, of course, the dragon. I mean, that was the, in the or original idea, so there had to be a dragon. And the other one was another knight, because um, I thought, who is the knight going to meet first? Well, probably another knight. Um, so, oh, I forgot to tell about uh, the story. So it's basically about uh, a knight with amnesia. So he wakes up in the middle of a forest and he completely forgot about everything. Uh, and he just sees this, uh, this castle, uh, which is guarded by a dragon. And he thinks, oh, I have to save the princess from the, from the dragon. And he goes on to this epic quest, uh, fighting all the enemies that he faces. But all the enemies are like, okay, dude, what are you doing? Why are you fighting me, you know? So, but before I, um, I move on to the I Night to Remember story, I will just uh, tell a bit about storytelling itself. About the hero's journey, also known as the monomyth. Uh, has, an, has anyone ever heard of the hero's journey? S one, okay. <laughs> That's not too many. Okay, this is basically the story behind all the other stories. So, when, you, uh, when you've heard this story, you will recognize basically every movie you've ever seen. So, uh, it, has a, it has a few uh, common themes that happen all the time. So, the story starts with the call to adventure. So, there's this guy in a normal world, and then suddenly he gets this, this call. It can be a literal call, like in the Matrix, or it can be someone who says, yeah, you have to go on an epic journey, or maybe a wizard or something who has a ring. And uh, at first, the guy says, no, no, I don't want to go on the journey, but still, um, the... The guy that says the the guy that gave the call to adventure gives him some item or gives him some information to persuade him to go. This is called supernatural aid. Um, in this case, it it can also be a lightsaber. Like, oh, we have this magical world with lightsabers. You can, you should join us. So, in order to get to the other world, you first have to cross the first threshold, which is usually uh, guarded somehow. Um, uh, usually guarded by a magical creature of some way that, that uh, belongs to the rules of the other world. Like, like in uh, Harry Potter when he uh, has to face the first magical enemies and stuff. Uh, so you have to defeat a guardian. Usually in games this means uh, defeating the first boss of the game. In Super Mario you start off in a normal world with trees and clouds etc. And then after you beat the first world then, then things get 
really strange. So when you enter this new world, you uh, come into the stage that's also known as the belly of the whale, and it's basically the, the darkness of, of this new world, the, the big unknown. Like, okay, what, what is going on here? And then as you settle into this new world, you face the road of trials, which is a number of challenges um, that you have to face in order to uh, get accustomed to this world. And uh, especially for games, this is wonderful because you can just throw challenges at the player uh, and ease them into the, into the game. So, but the, um, the, the hero needs some kind of, some kind of help to, to aid him in his quest. So that's where these things come in. Uh, the meeting with the goddess, it's often a woman who gives him information or power or something. Uh, in, in Lord of the Rings, for example, it's the meeting with Galadriel and stuff. Um, and uh, the, the hero can acquire special powers like flight, that's, that's the most common one, or, or some kind of superpower. And uh, the ultimate boon is, is some kind of item that uh, represents either the, the goal of the quest, like w where were you going for, the, the holy relic or something, or it can be the, this, this magical weapon uh, that will aid you in, in the rest of your quest. However, we're not there yet because the hero somehow has to uh, transform. He has to transcend himself because the way he is now, he, he, he probably cannot, um, he cannot beat whoever is at the end of the road of trials. So in some cases, this means lit literal uh, death and rebirth, like in the Matrix, spoilers. And in some other uh, games and, and stories, maybe you know uh, one of them, I I ha I've only put one here be because it's a really big uh, spoiler otherwise. So uh, the, the hero has, has finally left his old self and is reborn into this awesome person and he is ready to, to face his, his final enemy. Um, and in this case, it's usually called the atonement with the father. Uh, it doesn't really have to be the father, in Star Wars it is, but it can also be the uncle, like in The Lion King. But this is usually the final boss. This is what everything is about. Um, and once the, uh, once the hero beats this guy, he becomes the new ruler of the world or the new master. Or, um, and then afterwards, there's the return. He has to return to his old world, but he has completely changed. Uh, he has this new power, this new information. Uh, and uh, often after the final boss, the, the game instantly stops, but some like like Journey, also have this, this return to, the, to whatever you are going for, but you, also you always notice that, that the hero has some kind of superpowers. Okay, so moving on to um, storytelling in general, I'm going from bad to good. Let's start with the worst kind of storytelling, which is text. I mean, if I want to play a game that's only made of text, I would have read a book. So let's not do that. Um, just one step beyond is a lot of dialogue, so it's still a lot of reading, reading, reading. And I know that that some games, like the Phoenix Wright series, uh, really need a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of text, and they can't have voice acting and stuff. But still, if you can avoid this, uh, please avoid it. Like I really loved Golden Sun, but not the endless please skip, skip, skip. Yeah, if even like going into a cave, they were discussing for hours if they should go. And yeah, of course we're going in. So moving on to the third step, cutscenes. Because watching is a lot better than reading. So uh, you, can, uh, you can tell the entire story with cutscenes uh, between the fights, for example, uh, like I do in uh, A Night to Remember. But we can go even beyond cutscenes. This is Grand Theft Auto V, and Grand Theft Auto V is awesome. So they have these, um, uh, they tell the story from the angle of three different people, and uh, that's awesome, but that's not the point that I wanna make here. The point that I wanna make here is that they have chained missions. So for example, you have to hunt down someone, but at the time you hunt him down, he, um, he escapes and you get into a gunfight or you get into a, a helicopter chase or whatever. Um, so they have all these different kinds of gameplays into the same mission. And you are really uh, playing uh, the story uh, that way. And then 
we get to the most awesome uh, thing ever. This is Final Fantasy Crisis Core, uh, the ending of Final Fantasy Crisis Core, and this this is completely insane. So uh, in the story, you have uh, at the top left uh, three characters, and there's this slot machine. And if you get three characters in a row, you get like superpowers and stuff. But at the end, he is fighting uh, an infinite battle against all the soldiers in the back, and you know he's not going to win because in the next uh, game in the series, this guy is no longer alive. So you know he's going to die right here. Um, but um, the, the characters on the top left are slowly disappearing. As he's fighting this, this battle that he is going to lose, the, these people are, are disappearing. They, they're blanking out. And every time a character blanks out, you get a little cutscene where he's trying to remember the person, but the, the memory gets vaguer and vaguer just until the person completely disappears. So this was, when I played this, I was like, oh, I was really emotional. <laughs> I still feel it right now. And it became even more awesome after that because he beat all these guys and then he was like crippled. And, but the game continued on. So it was really difficult to steer the guy as he was crippled. So the game itself was making it impossible to continue just until he finally, finally, finally died. And that was, whoa, that was really painful. So what, does these, what do these guys have in common except for the spiky hair? is that they all have a story based on memory loss, of course. Uh, so this is uh, Cloud from, from Final Fantasy VII and um, Leonard from uh, Memento. The Knight from A Night to Remember, you all know him by now, and uh, Roxas from Kingdom Hearts. And um, the whole idea of, of a memory loss is that you can uh, put the player into the story straight away. Because it's like, okay, there is this story, but we're not going to bother you with all the with all the stuff, we'll put you straight into the fights, and then we'll tell the story as the hero is slowly remembering everything. So that's basically what I did with uh, A Night to Remember as well. Within five seconds, you uh, get into the first fight. However, um, because this um, memory loss thing was going to be really complicated for people to understand, I thought, okay, the story itself needs to be as cliche as possible. Uh, just to make sure that everything else, the plot twists and all, because it's not that standard. Um, I need to have a, a route that everyone thinks, okay, I know exactly what's going to happen. So it's about a knight that has to save a princess from a dragon. And everything matches like the hero's journey with the call and etc. So, I'm, so the people really think that, okay, I know exactly what's going to happen. So we went uh, storyboarding. This was made by Derek. Um, and I have pages and pages and pages of this stuff. And it was, a, it was completely awesome to do this, like really. So then I went on to find voice actors. Voice, actors, uh, voice acting uh, auditions are awesome because all these people are trying to get the character that you've been developing for such a long while um, to give them a, a, a voice. And one of them, uh, had the voice of, of Oren from Final Fantasy X. And I thought, okay, so this guy is, is leading a guy with memory loss, so he, does, he has no idea what's going on, but he sounds really wise. So I said, okay, you sound like Oren, I want you, no matter what, and I got him. So yeah, I was really proud of that. And then the hero accidentally sounded like Titus, also from Final Fantasy X, and then the princess sounded like Riku, also from Final Fantasy X. So if you close your eyes and play the game, you're like, oh, whoa, this might be Final Fantasy X. Okay, completely different topic, artificial intelligence. What isn't artificial intelligence? This is not artificial intelligence. Um, when people think about artificial intelligence, the first thought you have is uh, angry robots taking over the world. But that, that, that really is not it. Um, so you have to think about um, uh, artificial intelligence like the brain of the robot and not so much the robot itself but you can also have artificial intelligence without the robot itself. So you can have just a computer that's, uh, that's intelligent somehow. So when I show you a screenshot of A Night to Remember, um, so you control the blue character and the computer uh, controls the red character um, and you have to uh, click these cards to match into attacks. So can I ask you, um, where is the artificial intelligence here? Is it the blue character? Is it the red character? 
Is it the cards? Nobody? Ah, okay. So the answer is that it's um, basically everything. Because the cards themselves are kind of intelligent. They uh, communicate with each other uh, to find if there are uh, any pairs are found. And um, uh, the, the characters themselves are also intelligent in the way that they have this entire rule set about what animation to show based on a lot of factors. And um, so it's not just, I was, ho I was really hoping you guys would, said, would say the, that it was the Red Knight. It's basically everything, everything. So what kind of artificial intelligence can you have in games? First of all, uh, the rubber band AI. The rubber band AI means that um, the strength of the AI changes based on the performance of the player. So this is most obvious in racing games. Um, if you are in the lead, then all the cars behind you uh, speed up. And if you are uh, behind, then all the cars in front of you slow down to give you a chance. And there's another one, the resistance-based AI. That's basically um, if the opponent is near defeat, he becomes stronger somehow. Um, the problem with this, however, is that when you are trying to beat the game and uh, the, the game becomes better and better and better, then eventually the game becomes infinitely good um, and it becomes impossible to beat. So that wasn't really a great idea for this game. I really tested it at, st at the start and it was really funny to see that I couldn't beat my own game ever. So, okay, I wasn't doing that. So what did I do? Well, th this isn't even the whole formula. So it's based on user performance, again, with a rubber band AI. So basically, if you play the game really well, the computer gets better at the game uh, so to make it more difficult for you. But also, if you make uh, big combos, then the opponent thinks, OK, then I'm also going to make big combos. So you'll feel really good about making combos, but then the opponent is just going to kick your ass anyway. Uh, there's also a difficulty toggle. If you are ahead, um, the AI uh, moves into hard mode. So it becomes even harder than the rest of the formula thinks that it should be. But if you are nearing death, then the, uh, the game is uh, easing, is, is, uh, becomes more easy, because uh, I noticed that people losing the game really hate it, and then they just stop playing. But now you are near death, and you still have a chance to win. And people really, really love that, because they really have the, the feeling of um, victory, if it came from, um, if it came from a pinch, so that was it. That was my time, I think. Do you have some questions? I'm wondering um, if you're deploying your uh, game on multiple different platforms and how you went about testing on different, you know, service works on iOS for iPad for Droid. Um, so I designed the game to. Uh, thank you for your question. So I designed the game to work on uh, touch devices anyway. Currently, it's a browser-based game, but I'm going to port it to iOS and Android. Um, I'm also presenting it on a touch screen, uh, just to show how. Uh, the gameplay would be if it were on uh, on a tablet, so it doesn't have any keyboard controls, etc. So if I'm going to port it, then I don't have to change the control scheme, and that's already uh, a big plus, I think. Does it answer your question? Okay, thank you so much. Don't forget to see the award ceremony for in the in the contest, and don't forget to see a movie about uh, conference. Now at noon at Elite Hall. Thank you so much for your amazing You're welcome. lecture.